Heavenly Father, as we open the Word of God now, we pray for your Spirit to guide our thinking. And Lord, we pray for holy angels to be in here to impress us and speak to us as we listen to the Scriptures. And Father, I would pray that you would cause me to step to the side and that you would shine through what is said here today. And Lord, I pray this prayer from the bottom of my heart that you will have the glory here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you're turning to Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, we're going to isolate verses 1 through 6 in just a moment, but I want to say some thoughts that I think will prepare us to understand this passage. Now, have you ever heard the term nominal Christian? This notorious term describes a person who claims to be a Christian, but their actions do not consistently support this profession. You can see that the heart is not really in the experience, although there is a profession there. In other words, a high profession is made and and lip service is given to Christ, but they do not live or practice their faith in a genuine and sincere and living manner. Their words and actions do not consistently back up their alleged Christian claims. Now, the Apostle Paul, I believe, described a nominal Christian in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, when he described individuals in the last days when perilous times would come, that men would be lovers of their own selves and blasphemous, etc. And he goes through this long list. And then he concludes that thought by saying they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And he's not talking about people that have not professed Christ. He's talking about people in the church. Not about people outside of Christian circles. And so he's describing a nominal Christian. You see, these people who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, live in a way that is contradictory to the character of Christ. Now, to be fair, I believe that one of the biggest challenges we face as Christians is having an experience that is commensurate with our knowledge and our profession. Quite often our knowledge and our profession far exceeds what we're experiencing in our lives as far as our Christian walk is concerned. And I think one of the things that we need to realize is that we must make and be diligent in our efforts to place ourselves where God can empower our experience to match our profession so that we go beyond a mere profession of faithfulness into the realm of being a genuine practitioner of Christianity. So here's a penetrating question today that we might ask ourselves. And I'm going to ask myself in my own language here, is my example and lifestyle consistent with my profession? Now, I'm not saying that we don't make occasional mistakes and slip up, but I'm talking about the consistent trend of the life. Is my profession or my experience consistent with my profession? You know, we talk an awful lot about witnessing. We talk an awful lot about finishing the work. We talk an awful lot about sharing the Adventist message with people and the Christian message with people around us. But often we fail to realize that a mere intellectual presentation of truth will not impact people for the truth. You know what will? Of course, the Spirit of God has to be working. But you know what is tremendous in breaking up the ground of the hearts of listeners that we share with? Our own example. Because when our example matches what our profession is, then a heavenly influence attends what we share and impacts those who listen. And so a question that I think we need to reflect on today is, is my example giving convincing power to my witness, and does it match up with my profession? A mere profession alone 
will do great harm to the gospel. In fact, there's a book written by a man named Michael Hart. It's an older book. It's pro it probably was written in the 70s or 80s. I, I have a copy of it. And he entitled this book called The 100. And what he does in this book is he takes people in history, people that have lived throughout human history that have made tremendous impacts on human history, and he ranked them from 1 to 100. And, of course, the first person would be the most influential person, and then the hundredth would be the hundredth most influential person. Well, guess what Jesus ranked in this book? Three, That's right. He ranked third. You have the book? He ranked third. Mohammed was number one, and Isaac Newton was number two. Jesus was third. And you know, he wrote a section on each person in this book. And he qualifies his ranking of Jesus as third in this book by saying, the reason why I put Jesus third in this book is not because of Jesus. It's because of his professed followers and their failure to live up to the golden rule that he taught when he walked this earth. Now, that's, that's an ouch, okay? I'm not trying to be critical, but that is a very sobering observation by a man who I don't think even professes any religion. In fact, I think this gentleman is an Ivy League scholar. And when I read that, I thought to myself, Lord, can we as Christians actually do damage to how people perceive you and, and your message for this time? And I came to the conclusion that it's because we have failed, in many cases, as Christians to reflect an accurate picture of God in our experience. And so, as we think about this this morning, let us consider a stark reality. And let's be frank. The brand of popular Christianity that we see today in the Christian world is not the Christianity that was lived out in apostolic times. It's a watered-down, popular version, even in Adventist circles, by the way, that gives the impression that most professed Christians are Christians really only in name. And they are spiritually destitute of a living relationship with God that shows that the first love is alive and well in the soul of that professed Christian. And if we think as Seventh-day Adventists that we're immune to this, we better think again. We are deceiving ourselves. Because we must be alive, brothers and sisters, spiritually. So let's ask ourselves this morning. Although we have a living name, are we in reality spiritually destitute and dead? We could ask ourselves this question. Am I spiritually dead? Am I a Christian in name only? And I've even met people that are faithful in tithing. They're faithful in dress reform. They're faithful in health reform. They're faithful in Sabbath observance. They're faithful right down the line. But they're as dry as the hills of Gilboa, spiritually speaking, because again, their religion has degenerated into an endless round of ceremonies. Now, I'm not denying, I, I want to qualify this, I'm not denying the importance of those reforms because those reforms are crucial. But it is possible to get to a point to where we're just mechanically going through those things, but we're dead spiritually. And I want to appeal to you this morning, is this you? Is this me? Is this us as a movement? Is this us as a Christian religion around the world, brothers and sisters? I believe that a large part of professed Christians today are going through this experience of being spiritually dead while having a living name, but they would never admit it. But let's be honest with ourselves. We must be alive spiritually and have an experience that is commensurate with our profession in the name that we carry, the name of Christ. So friends, as you think about your life today, do you have that living name, but inside you feel spiritually dead? Well, if you answer yes to this question, I want to encourage you not to despair. Even though I've painted a pretty grim picture, I'm sure, up to this point. 
don't despair because, you know, when we look at the Sardis church, Jesus counseled this church because this church at Sardis had the very same problem. And He offered some tremendous counsel to this church. And as we go through this passage for a few moments and reflect on its phrases and, and principles that it brings out, let us take our thinking to another level and let us look spiritually uh, and insightfully into this passage and read between the lines and see what God is saying to us so that we can be alive once again. Amen. So, as we look at Revelation 3, verse 1, this is the fifth church. We've addressed Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, and now we're jumping into Sardis, the fifth church of the seven churches. And this church was told the following, Revelation 3, 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. Now notice the quality of Christ that is mentioned here. We're going to see that that is needed for this church. So these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name which thou livest, and art dead. In other words, you have a living name, but you're really spiritually dead. Verse 2, be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, there's a mouthful there as there normally is with each of these seven churches. And we're, we're going to go through and, and, and talk about what Jesus is saying to this church in just a moment. But let's talk about ancient Sardis as a city, because I think you're going to find that there's some very interesting th details about that city that can be applied spiritually to God's people. Ancient Sardis was actually a city built on a steep hill that was heavily fortified with strong protective walls on very high ground. Yet, despite this great tactical position, the city was actually conquered at least three different times in the ancient world prior to John's day. The first time it was conquered, it was conquered by Cyrus the Great in 547 B.C. The next conqueror to take the city was Alexander the Great, who conquered this city in 334 B.C. The third conqueror to conquer this city was another great, Antiochus the Great, who was actually Antiochus III, who conquered that city in 218 B.C. Antiochus was a Seleucid Syrian king who lived in the intertestamental period. And so we can see that Cyrus the Great, Antiochus the Great, and, and uh, Alexander the Great all conquered the city of Sardis at one point prior to John's day. Now, why was this city in such a, a, an advantageous tactical position conquered? Well, it was highly overconfident in its position and walls, and the people there felt that they could not be breached. And they felt no, they'd even felt no need to post any guards on watch. Now, think spiritually. All right, you with me? We're going to come back to that. But this city was very overconfident in its position and walls, felt it could not be breached, and they didn't even feel the need to post any guards to, to watch. Thus, when an invader came and found no guards on duty, the city was caught unaware and unprepared, and it was conquered. Now, there are some powerful spiritual lessons there we'll come back to. 
But ancient Sardis was a very interesting city. It eventually fell into Roman hands when the will of its last king, Attalus III of Pergamum, actually bequeathed his kingdom to Rome after he died. When he died, his will was read, and he had actually willed the empire of Pergamum to Rome, in which was Sardis. Sardis was located in that kingdom. Now, by John's day, Sardis had grown into a strong commercial center, and it was known for its wool and dyeing industry, similar to Thyatira. Interestingly, its patron deity was Sibel, a deity that could allegedly bring the dead back to life. Now, it's interesting that Jesus is the real God that can bring the dead back to life. So there's a very important lesson there. But that was the patron deity of that city. Now, as far as the Christians in Sardis, they started off powerful and strong spiritually, but eventually they degenerated into a deplorable spiritual condition. They had waned in their experience to the, to the point where they became lazy, complacent, and careless in a spiritual sense. They had not been watchful. Remember, there were no spiritual guards there, in addition to there being no literal guards there. And they were putrefied in their religious experience over time. They continued to call themselves Christians, but they were really spiritually dead. You might even say that ancient Sardis grew too confident in their spiritual position, thinking that their truths alone made it unnecessary to be watchful. Now, that's an Adventist statement, right? Amen. But listen, there's some strong lessons here that we need to, listen, to, to look at. As a result, while professing to be living Christians, they were really spiritually dead. And what's interesting is the name Sardis itself actually means Prince of Joy, and it can also mean the title of this sermon, Strengthen What Remains, Strengthen the Things That Remain. And so the very name of this church describes its spiritual condition, and Jesus appealed to this church. This church had once been a prince of joy to Christ, having a living name and a living experience together. But later, eventually, this experience eroded into spiritual death. The truth still remained within their spiritual borders, but they didn't appreciate it any longer. And it grew cold and lifeless. It lost its freshness. So that first love waned. Christ, as a result of this, called these Christians to strengthen what remained by getting back to the truths that had first set them free. These believers were in desperate need of a spiritual revival. And this need for revival is where the description of Christ would help their spiritual condition. Sardis needed the seven spirits of God. These things saith he that, that hath the seven spirits of God and hath the seven stars, right? The seven spirits of God is a phrase that describes the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent power of the Spirit of God. That alone can bring life and spirituality back into the dry bones of a degenerate Christian experience. Yeah. Ezekiel 37 talked about that. The prophet cried out, oh, my Lord, will these bones live? And, and he was told by, by God Almighty to, breathe, to, to prophesy under the wind, and the wind blew, and the bones grew uh, muscles and sinews and came back to life as a great army that went out to proclaim the gospel. And that's what Jesus is calling this church to do. Amen. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. We need the Spirit of God in our lives, brothers and sisters. And the seven stars, Jesus said... Uh, they also need. And what do the seven stars represent? Well, stars represent angels. And evidently, this church had angelic overseers watching over this congregation. But they can also apply to human messengers. And, and God was telling them, listen, these messengers, as they stand in the desk of God and preach the Word of God and preach the truth, let that truth find resonance in your heart and let it grow and bear fruit. Amen. And let that spiritual revival take control of your spiritual experience. This is what Jesus was saying to the people at Sardis, to the Christians at Sardis, so that they could experience a powerful spiritual revival and strengthen those things that were ready to die. The truth that was dying in their hearts was to be brought back alive and strengthened once again through the power of the Spirit of God. Now Christ's call to Sardis was very specific. 
They were to remember how they first had heard and received the truth, and they were called to hold fast to that precious truth and repent of their nominal condition. They were also to watch and be ready in a spiritual sense. Otherwise, Christ would come unexpectedly as a thief. And that implies that when Jesus finally comes, He would find them unready and in an unsaved condition when He returns. God help us. We don't want to be in that category. So there's a call to repentance. Now, thankfully, there were faithful Christians in Sardis who had not soiled their garments, so to speak. They were faithful to Christ because they were cultivating Christian virtues and character qualities, and they were striving to be faithful to God so they could claim the righteousness of Christ as their own. Jesus said, because of their faithfulness, they would walk with Him in white, for they have been found worthy. Those in Sardis who were to be overcomers would retain this white raiment, and their names would not be blotted out of the book of life. They would be retained in the book of life, and their names would be confessed by Jesus before His Father and before heavenly angels. Amen. Remember, Jesus said, those who confess Me before men will be confessed before My Father and before His angels, but those who don't will be denied. But these faithful Sardis Christians were to be confessed before heavenly realms because of their fidelity to Christ. This is Jesus' counsel to the church at Sardis. So how can we relate to this now? What does this mean for you and I? Well, I think the application is obvious, but let me, let me just say this. I believe there's three ways we can look at this. We can look at this in a historical way. We can look at this in a Seventh-day Adventist manner, and we can look at this in a personal manner. Let's first talk about the historical. We understand the seven churches apply to historical phases of church history, right? Ephesus was the apostolic age. Smyrna was the age of persecution. Pergamus was the age of, of how the church degenerated and began to marry the, the state. And the Thyatiran church described the condition of the medieval church during the Dark Ages. And, and that took us to the year 1517 when Luther and his associates began the Protestant Reformation. And I believe that the Sardis period begins with, with, with 1517 when, when Luther began the Reformation through to the year 1798 when the papacy was removed from secular power by the French armies. And so the Sardis period in a historical sense went from 1517 to 1798. That's kind of where I'm at on that. Now, how was the church in that day? Did the Protestant Reformation affect a revival in the church that made it a prince of joy? Did not the Protestant movement start as a movement on fire for God where, where they had discovered precious truths that for, love, for many ages had been, been lost to the Christian world? And they discovered these and, and this was a, a, a vivacious movement that, that experienced a great revival and the fires of Protestantism spread all over Europe in the world as a result of that experience of being a prince of joy. But you know what? Over time, the Protestant movement lost momentum. It degenerated over time, over the decades, into a creedal movement. Wow. That applied to us. They had a form, and they strictly adhered to their creeds in an unrelenting way, but they were spiritually dead. And I believe the Reformation was in danger of coming into a complete standstill had God not raised up the Advent movement. Which, by the way, will start to come into the Philadelphia church that we'll look at in the near future. And so that's a historical application. Now, you could also apply this experience to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. We started off as a, as a powerful spiritual movement, Great spiritual revival. God took the Millerites through the great disappointment. He raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church as, as a movement of prophecy. Started off with great zeal and power, and the, the experience was commensurate with the profession. The present truth was there, but the experience empowering this truth was there. And this movement went all over the world. You know, we are one of only two churches in the world that are in nearly every country on the globe. And I won't even tell you what the other church is. <laughs> but it's been 160 plus years, hasn't it? Since our inception. And, and, and again, not to be critical, but to get us thinking, where are, have we degenerated? 
to where we have a living name, but, but in reality, our hearts have grown cold because of the abounding iniquity and the love of many growing cold. Many of us in our midst, and I've been threatened with this, you know, I almost lost my soul several years ago trying to write an evangelistic series because I, had, I was so worried about putting this series together, I almost lost my relationship with Jesus because I, I did not maintain my devotions through that experience. It's, so, it's, it's, it's possible to be so wrapped up even in the work of the church that we could lose ourselves, brothers and sisters. Doug Batchelor said once, you're so busy with the work of the Lord that you forget the Lord of the work. It's an interesting statement, easy to remember, that always stuck out in my mind. But, but I wonder about us as a people. Has our movement, has the, the proverbial snowball that's gone down the hill kind of leveled out now, and is the, is the momentum slowing down a little bit? That's why I'm so thankful that we have a general conference president who's encouraging revival and reformation. Amen. Because we're told from inspiration that's the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. Amen. And so we could apply Sardis to our movement here. Are we SDAs in name only? Or do we need to strengthen the things that remain, the truths of our message that are ready to die? And as individual Seventh-day Adventists, must we guard against spiritual pride and remain watchful? Because like ancient Sardis, we might be in danger of not having watchmen on the wall, watchmen on the wall, guarding the borders of the city before it's overtaken. You understand? Where are the watchmen today? Amen. They're being faithful. I tremble. And I don't think I'm better than anybody else, believe me. People come up to me and they say, you're faithful in your preaching. You know, I, let me tell you something. I'm one choice away from falling myself just like you are. I'm no better than anybody. Just I want to be faithful to God. But God needs people that will be true Amen. and sincere Amen. and loving and yet Amen. unwilling to compromise Amen. to the enemy. Amen. And I'm so worried that, that we've, we've swung to where we want to be so loving that it's to the point to where we compromise. We've got to have a balance. Amen. Right? And so maybe we should think about these things today. We can also apply this artist's condition, as I've been emphasizing, to our own personal lives. Do we and do I still appreciate the truths that God has entrusted to me? I know some people have told me that who are raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church, they don't always have the same appreciation because it's all they know and that's all they're familiar with and it's become common over time because it's, it's what they're used to, you know, it's all they know. And that people that are grafted into Israel later on have a greater appreciation because it's fresh. But you know what, friends? Even those of us who have been grafted in can still be in danger of spiritual death. And we've got to make sure that we're staying close to Christ. Is our Christianity genuine? Is it alive? Or are we such in name only? This is a question I've had to ask myself. Does my life consistently reflect a Christianity that is alive? Do the closest people to me see a consistent resolve in my Christian experience to be faithful to God? Or do they see a bunch of religious forms without the power? That's an interesting question. I went to my wife several years ago. We were at a camp meeting. And as we listened to certain messages that were preached there, I felt so heavily convicted that I, I needed to be closer to Christ. And I, I told my wife one day, I said, you know, Sarah, I asked her, am I a hypocrite? Because you see me stand up there and you see me preach and yet you know me behind closed doors. Am I a hypocrite? Because the day that you come to me and you tell me you need to quit being a hypocrite, is the day that I step down and I'll surrender my credentials and let someone else come and fill this void and preach who's trying to be faithful. Because I don't ever want to be a hypocrite. Now, do we struggle? I'm not, I'm not talking about human weakness where we struggle. Because we all have character imbalances that God is trying to polish. Yeah. All right? I'm talking about the trend of the life. All right? 
I'm talking about our consistent experience with God. And I told my wife, if you ever see me to the point to where I'm, I'm a hypocrite and I'm consistently just giving lip service with no experience, then please tell me because that's the day I step down. And you know what she said to me in that conversation? She said, well, God's working with you, honey. <laughs> and she told me, look, when I first met you, you were, the, you, were, you were it, man. You were the cat's meow. I looked at you and I was like, man, that dude is it. But then we got married. And then we started living together after our marriage. And then it's like, whoa, full-length mirror. My husband has some imbalances. They didn't really come out too much when we were in the dating phase. And that's why it pays for those, for those of you young people who might be considering relationships, really get to know the person. I mean, my wife and I were friends for four or five years before we even dated, and we still had a, a, some level of a rude awakening when we finally got married and lived together. And so it's never easy when you try to blend two personalities together. It takes work. It takes the, it takes the gospel to make it really be the blessing that God designs it to be. But the point is, is that I was asking her about consistency and not being a hypocrite. And I think that's a question that we should ask ourselves. Do those closest to me see a consistent resolve? Or do they see religious forms? Let us be found consistent in both profession and experience. Amen. I'd like to also tell you that I believe that we're in the midst of a shaking. Did you uh, catch the scripture reading? The time will come when anything that can be shaken will be shaken, so the things that cannot be shaken will remain. Amen. Right? God. You see, we're in a shaking time, friends. And I'm going to say this, and this is a military term. I don't mean it to sound rough and, and, and gruff, but we're in a time where all the non-hackers are being shaken out. We're all, where there's, a, where there's a, a dividing line to where people who have a mere profession are being separated from those who are genuine. And that's what the investigative judgment's about, by the way. Yes. To separate the professed from the sincere and genuine. And so we must be very careful, brethren and sisters, because if we grow weary of our watch and, and have grown overconfident and lazy in our watchfulness, then we are in the biggest danger of dying spiritually because the enemy will come in unawares. Just like ancient, ancient Sardis was conquered. You see, you see, see, there have been times in my experience where I've been almost arrogant about what I know. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. We've got biblical truth. Whew. I can remember one time I was sharing the Sabbath with two young ladies. This was right after I was baptized and I was witnessing to them and I was being that watchman on the wall, you know, I was sharing the message with them. And, and, and I presented this logical argument that the seventh day was the Sabbath. I mean, it was, and it was airtight. There was, nothing, there was no reproach upon the witness that they could give. But you know what they said to me after? They said, Mark, you know what? We're, we can't refute anything you're saying. And, and, and obviously the Sabbath is important because it's one of God's Ten Commandments, and we need to look at that. But you're being so argumentative, and you're coming across as though you're spiritually arrogant, like you're better than us. Now, I don't see the love of Christ in you. And I was just like, ooh, what time is it? I'm, you know what? i got to head out of here. And I, I popped out that front door pretty quickly after that. But I learned from that, right? Right. That we can never be arrogant to the point to where we think we're better than other people. Because that's a part of growing weary, in a sense. Overconfident. Well, my truth's enough to save me. Well, sometimes we forget that truth is also a person. It's not just a set of teachings. It's Jesus Christ. And it's only Christ alone that can save us. Now, the truths we have illuminate the character of Christ more deeply. And give us a deeper understanding of what He's like. But it's Jesus Christ alone that is our redemption. Amen. And it's His righteousness. By the way, nothing we can add to, but it's His righteousness that will save us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why Jesus appeals for Sardis Christians to remember that white garment. And to be that overcomer in your life. So that you can be clothed with white raiment and your name will not be blotted out of the book of life, but it will be immortalized 
pen of iron and with the point of a diamond in the Lamb's book of life. So that your name and my name will be proclaimed through heavenly realms by Jesus Christ, confessed before the sinless universe of God. Think of it, that one day that will happen. But we must be found faithful in the process. We must learn to go beyond mere forms and become genuinely spiritual once again, to strengthen what remains in our message and, and hold fast to those great principles that we love that are ready to die. Because I'll tell you right now, Satan is throwing every distraction he can at us to try to draw our affections away, to bind the strong man so that the home of the strong man can be entered and spoiled. We don't want that. We must be found faithful in our watch. We must be willing to honestly examine our lives and really understand what is. If, if we are on the path to spiritual death or maybe at the point of spiritual death, we must be willing to honestly examine yes. what has brought us to this point. And if we're discerning, you know what God will do? God will take us right back to the very point where we were tempted to stray. And He will encourage us to go back and go through those things again and make those things right. Yes. You know, I left the Lord for 16, 17 years. At the age of 11, I made a decision that carried me away from Christ, and it wasn't until I was 27 when I got rebaptized, that God was able to bring me back. And as I searched my soul in that time, when I, at the point of baptism, I had wondered why I'd gotten to that point, and God took me back to that very decision that I had made. And so be honest with yourself. Yes. Say, Lord, show me what has brought me to this point, and rekindle those revival fires in my heart, so that I can fulfill that scripture where Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.19, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ to depart from iniquity and be right with God. So as you look at your life this morning, what is preventing you from complete consecration? Not to say you're perfect or not to say your character is perfectly symmetrical. Not to say that you aren't struggling with things in your life. Not to say that you may be in a wrestling period right now with God over something. Maybe going through a trial, going through a challenge that is really testing your faith to the uttermost. All those things might be present. But you know what? What you need to understand is it is possible to look at those things and surrender all of them to God so that you can be right with God right now. You don't have to wait until you're better because you know what? You can't make yourself better. All you can do in a human sense is choose to place yourself in the hand of Christ and let Him do what He's already done in His own life. Because it's Christ's life that stands in the place of our lives. Not just in an imputed fashion, but an imparted fashion. Not just credited, but replicated in the life. And so all you have to do this morning is choose. I want to choose. Amen. Yes. Just this morning, God showed me something in my life that, I, that I've been aware of, but I've never been willing to deal with up to this point. And some of you, if I told you what it was, I won't. But if I told you what it was, you'd think, man, that's no big deal, man. Why are you getting all worried about that? Well, you know what? It doesn't matter how big or how little something is. If something is impeding our relationship with God, guess what? It must go Amen. at some point, Amen. right? And so I said to the Lord, Lord, forgive me. And my eyes watered up this morning because I felt so ashamed that I had valued that thing more than Jesus Christ. And I said, Lord, I need a paradigm shift here in my mind. I, I need to make you first and last and best in everything. I need to value you Amen. above everything. Amen. So that as I catch a glimpse of, of your character and your love for me and what you've gone through to make it possible for me to live forever with you, 
May that understanding help that issue to shrink into insignificance. And may this shame increase in a healthy way to make me feel ashamed that I even thought to value that above you. So help me to have victory. What choice do you need to make today? What is preventing you from being a completely genuine and sincere and surrendered and consecrated Christian today? If you're honest with yourself, you know what God is calling you to do. You know what choice He's calling you to make. And I wasn't even going to make a call this morning because I thought, man, I call these people to death. They're going to, it's going to get common. But you know, I must open the altar today for all of us. So if you feel called to come forward and make a special commitment in some area of your life because we want to have a special prayer, I would invite you to come forward. We want to sing, I believe it's 319. Is it 319? Yes. Lord, I want to be a Christian. As we sing these stanzas, if God is calling you to make a special appeal, a special commitment, a special choice today to surrender something to Him that will move you closer to Him so that you can have a living name and come back from the precipice of spiritual death to be alive once again, then I would encourage you to come forward. And as we sing this song, let's sing it with all our hearts, please. And come forward with sincerity, and we will pray and pour out our souls to God and plead for His blessings that He will pour out His Spirit upon us, that those seven spirits of God will revive us and bring us back into a relationship that is spiritually alive once again. Nineteen. Jesus. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart.
let us kneel together and pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege that we could call you our Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making a way out for us, for not instantly destroying us as sinners, but for making a plan of redemption that we can submit to, that you might be able to give us the gift of eternal life. We realize, Lord, that we cannot save ourselves and that we are rotten sinners to the very core of our nature. And so we recognize this today, Lord, and we have come to you seeking forgiveness and seeking pardon, seeking to be cleansed, to have that filthy garment completely removed and to experience a complete change in raiment that we might be clothed with your righteousness, that our names would be retained in the book of life because evidently they can be removed. So Lord, don't, don't remove our names. Keep them there. And Lord, may you confess us before heavenly realms because we are striving to be faithful to you. We have come to you this morning wanting to commit or recommit in some area of our lives. And as we surrender ourselves in this particular area, Lord, please accept our surrender. Please see the sincerity and the heart cry that we are expressing to you now. And Lord, it's not that we want to take advantage of you, but we know that you are moved by a broken and contrite heart, and you're so benevolent and loving that You cannot resist the cry of the penitent, contrite heart because you can see the sincerity. And we are sincere this morning, Lord. We want to be right with you. So answer our prayer in the fullness of your spirit, Lord. Baptize us anew. Revive us from spiritual death and make us alive once again. Give the truths of our message a freshness that we've lost. And may our relationship with you be revived. May these dry bones receive the wind of the Spirit of God. And may we become the army spiritually that you want us to be, that we might be the gospel sentinels that are faithful on the wall so that the, the spiritual city of your kingdom, of your church, will not be overtaken by the enemy. Let us not grow confident, Lord, and arrogant, but let us be humble and realize that in you alone is our strength. And Lord, as we leave now, we pray that no trifling thought will remove the conviction that we are experiencing. Don't let the dark one bring in anything that will cause this commitment today to lose its power in our lives. And as we enjoy the Sabbath today, may these hours be a special time a special period of time for our souls. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.